Hello. Welcome everyone to WHQR's prologue with Ben Steelman. We are happy that you're here tonight. We think it's going to be a super program. Um, I am Mary Bradley. I'm the development director at WHQR. And uh, if you have questions during our program, please put them in the Q&A and I will ask Bland for you. But let's get right into things. I'm going to introduce Ben Steelman and he can kick us off. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you, Mary. I'm starting to feel my age. And I remembered back when I was an undergraduate in Chapel Hill, and there were these two wild guys named uh, Bland Simpson and Jim Wan, who were uh, picking and grinning and, uh, and, uh, sing and singing and performing over at the old Kratz Cradle in Chapel Hill. Uh, the picking and grinning eventually developed into a show called Diamond Studs, which opened at the ranch house in Chapel Hill and eventually moved off Broadway. And uh, Mr. Simpson and his various collaborators went on to do a bunch of show, uh, sh uh, shows that toured, many of which got, to, uh, got uh, uh, very, very close to Broadway, including Hot Grog, King Mackerel and the Blues Are Running, uh, the, uh, the Tar, Heel, uh, Tar, Tar Heel Voices, and uh, with the late uh, Doug Marlett, the uh, musical uh, version of Kudzu. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, in the meantime, Mr. Simpson uh, uh, got very busy uh, writing. He uh, produced a string of novels, including The Mystery of the Beautiful Nell Cropsey, Ghost Ship of Diamond Shoals, and Heart of the Country, and a whole shelf of books about the North Carolina coast, including The Great Dismal, Into the Sound Country, the Inner Islands, Coasts of Carolina, and uh, and uh, and uh, small uh, small rivers and waterway tales, small rivers and waterway tales. He also detoured to write an interesting book, Two Captains from Carolina. One of those captains was the blockade runner John Newland Maffitt, who made the uh, who made Wrightsville Beach his home. Anyway. Uh, in 1982, he began teaching at his alma mater, UNC uh, North, Car uh, North Carolina Chapel Hill, and where he is now the Keenan Distinguished Professor of English and Creative Writing. Uh, since 1986, he has been a member of the, and, and keyboard player for the folk band, the, uh, the that may be unfair, the, uh, the, red, the, the, the famed Red Clay, uh, Clay Ramblers. He has uh, won the North Carolina Award for Fine Arts, and was uh, and was the uh, E. Kidder Graham uh, faculty uh, uh, service uh, recipient at, Ch at Chapel Hill, and uh, to, he's now branched out a little bit. Most of his uh, nature writing has been about Eastern North Carolina, but now he takes in the rest of the state with his new book from the University of North Carolina Press, uh, "North Carolina Land of Water, uh, Land of Sky." Please welcome Bland Simpson. Thank you very much, Ben. It's a, a real pleasure to be here with you this evening. And what would you like to talk about? Well, uh, uh, how, uh, how do you, uh, how do you, uh, how, how did you uh, branch out from your home territory into the uh, in, into the hinter, into the hinterland, so to speak, getting up into hill country and so forth? Well, I. I have a very good friend from Asheville, uh, David Perry, who was a longtime editor in chief at UNC Press. And we've worked together since he first brought me uh, into the press when he acquired The Great Dismal, about the Dismal Swamp. And uh, so we'd worked together for uh, much of 20 years. And, and uh, in the 2000s, sometime, he started saying, we need you to write a book about the whole state. And I um, didn't think a whole lot about it at first because I was so um, immersed, if you will, with uh, easternness and uh, swamps and sounds and rivers. But uh, after a number of years, he, he kept bringing this up. And um, I decided I've lived in the Piedmont most of my life. And so I decided to take on that project, and I'm very glad I did. Um, it's, it's been a beautiful uh, six years in the in the making, and um, Anne and I, my wife Anne, was the principal photographer, uh, joined 
with uh, by uh, Tom Earnhardt of Exploring North Carolina and Scott Taylor, with whom I'd done a book about the coasts. And we just had the, the, our quartet. We had a wonderful time putting uh, Land of Water, Land of Sky together. That's great. Um, tell me how. Uh, Tell me again the story about how you picked your uh, pick some of your locations. Something involves a highway map. Uh, the North Carolina highway map. I had it on hand. I was down in Beaufort, and Ann and I had just completed the um, uh, Little Rivers Waterway Tales book, which came out in uh, 2015. And I thought, well, I it was just after Christmas, and I thought I better be thinking about this North Carolina idea. So I spread the, the highway map out and I just very slowly and at times with the magnifying glass went over all the counties and put little bits of uh, post-it notes uh, anywhere, you know, with a note to myself, what this was about, anywhere I had a story or thought I had a story, uh, family anecdote uh, or knew of some important historical moment that I wanted to uh, dramatize. And so I covered that highway map with um, what became an outline. But that was the way I thought, I'm just going to sort of fly over the whole state and, uh, and see what I see. Well, so, when, as you said, as you set out and you started uh, writing stuff, were there, were, there, were there any places that sur uh, that surprised you? That you, you started out one way, but found, but uh, but found something else. Yes, uh, particularly where the mountains were concerned, because I just I've I've learned an awful lot about the mountains. Uh, well, from my friend David Perry, and. Uh, just as much or no less from the Queen family up in Haywood County. And um, I was surprised when I sat down to write about the, the mountains from their perspective, you know, how many of their tales and uh, so forth I had in my head, uh, just from what I've heard over uh, almost 50 years of friendship with uh, Frank and Joe Sam and, uh, and the Queen family. And, and also, Ben, just being in the presence of Linville Gorge uh, is a, a remarkable, not entirely comfortable experience for a, uh, a boy from the swamps. Uh, it just it takes your breath away. It takes your breath away, uh, quite literally. And um, Jerry Brown, uh, who great musician and uh, a studio acoustician here in Chapel Hill with the Rubber Room. Uh, Jerry grew up in Penland and he had been to Linville many times, but he told me uh, several years ago when we were talking about this book project, he said, I tell you what, Linville Gorge, he said, I've been all, I've played bluegrass all over North Carolina and um, Linville Gorge is the only place I've ever seen in North Carolina that just doesn't look like it belongs here. It's just too big and powerful and um, and he I mean it is here but he he had a lot to write about that comment um, it's it's a surprise uh, it's a surprising piece of geography and topography for sure it makes uh, make, uh, makes us a little eager to see it um, now, you are famous. Uh, you are famously a, a son of Elizabeth City, North Carolina, and you and you yes, uh, started and you started out uh, tooling around Albemarle Sound. But I understand your family also has uh, roots in Wilmington on your mother's side. Yes, my mother was born on Sixth uh, Street, just south of um, Market, just around the corner from the fountain. And the the home she was born in is is still there. It's a it's on the uh, west side of the street in that first block, and it's got a, a double bay window. The bay window goes all the way up the uh, side of the house, so it's, it's easy, to, easy to spot. But uh, all her siblings were born there. Uh, that's uh, five 
my mother and four aunts and uncles in all. My grandfather moved from a one mule, one horse uh, farm in Onslow County, where his family moved when he was 14. So he arrived in Wilmington uh, right after his uh, eighth grade. That was the end of his schooling or his uh, formal schooling. And um, he arrived right after the the coup of 1898, got there in 1900. And he went to work as a carpenter's apprentice. And he, he said he knew, he's a 14-year-old farm boy. He said, I knew as soon as I picked up the toolbox or the tool tray, you know, those old trays, long trays with a, a dowel to handle. He said, I knew as soon as I picked that up that this is what I wanted, really wanted to do. I wanted to learn to be a builder, a master builder. And so he was a carpenter's apprentice. He learned all the different trades and he um, started building uh, jails and fireproofing and renovating courthouses around Eastern Carolina and eventually got here to Chapel Hill and took over construction in the 1920s. Now, but it was you, Wilmington, you, were, you Wilmington were telling me this. You were telling me a story about how he worked during World War One on the original Wilmington shipyard, the one that was turning out concrete ships. He sure did, Ben. He he had uh, he was let's see he had two children by um, about 1915 and or three, and so he settled down uh, from being a, a journeyman um, tradesman, carpenter. Um, and he, he worked, uh, first I think he worked down at Fort Caswell uh, during the war itself for, for two years. And he came, and, you know, commuting by the uh, by steamship most likely. And then he came back to mainly live in, uh, with his family in, in town in Wilmington right when those concrete ships were getting built. They were contracted during the war, but they didn't start building them, building them until after the armistice and mainly sort of between late 1918 and 1922. And the, the uh, Cape Fear Museum has a photo archive of, uh, you know, pictures of those ships under construction and being launched and um, it's pretty dramatic to, to see, see all these people around the Cape Fear River and to see a, one of these gigantic concrete boats uh, go in water. My grandfather said they, uh, they heeled over so far that you thought they were going to sink, go all the way over, but they righted themselves kind of clumsily, I, th I think. Okay. Mary, uh, do we have some other questions for uh, Bland coming in now? We have just one, so please send your questions in. We have a nice large audience out there. Um, and the one we have is, what was your family name in Wilmington? Uh, Paige. I'm sorry. My, my um, grandmother, grandmother's there. The family name was Paige, P-A-G-E. And... Um, he also had a, my grandfather had a half sister who lived in Wilmington and her, um, her married name was Edwards. And uh, my cousin, Betsy Edwards uh, still, she lives out on Masonboro um, Sound. And um, so I've got, I've got family there yet still. And um, in fact, I asked Betsy's father, Eugene Edwards one time, I said, he said, oh, I remember your uh, great grandfather the the farmer who moved the family into into uh, Wilmington, I said, what did he do after they moved to Wilmington? He said, well, I don't know. He he had a sign that said he sharpened saws, but I never saw him sharpen a single saw. He said mostly what uh, this is Eugene Edwards of Wilmington talking. He said mostly he called all of us teenage boys over to. Uh, stand outside off his porch and listen to him hold forth on, on biblical matters. He, he also preached. This is my great grandfather. And I said, what kind of stuff did he preach, uh, Eugene? And uh, Gene said, uh, pretty much that all of us teenage boys were uh, terrible, sinful, 
awful creatures and um, we were pretty much all of us going straight to hell and um, um, he said that's what I mainly remember your great grandfather for but um, my grandfather Julius Page certainly um, thrived in Wilmington and, and um, you know loved the loved the city and um, and learned to be a great builder because I mean you know these monuments here at Chapel Hill, the Bell Tower, Keenan Stadium, uh, Wilson Library. My grandfather was in charge of building all of those. So he, he came a long way from the first time he picked up that tray of tools. Okay. We do have a few more questions. Um, let's see. Anonymous says, what do you think is the most romantic part of the state? Oh, wow. That's that's a lovely question. It's it's sort of putting me in the position of uh, choosing between children, and that's not something I could do. Um, I've just I've been so fortunate to be able to um, move around so much, both with my family and uh, with the string band Red, Red Clay Ramblers, and with the King Mackerel uh, crowd to see um, uh, Flat Rock and Connemara, where uh, Carl Sandburg lived and worked, uh, to be out on uh, core banks or, or any of the banks. They're all gorgeous from one end of the state to the other. And um, I love the, the mixed woods of the Piedmont. I love the sand hills with the, uh, all those longleaf pine. We still have, we're lucky to, to have some. And I think the longleaf pine population is growing. There are a lot of people working on that. Uh, I, I would, I think my favorite place in North Carolina is the one I'm in right at the moment. So um, as far as romantic, uh, you know, we're, we're blessed with all these, uh, some are lovely in an artistic way. I think the Black River is very romantic you know, that flows from near Clinton down to the Cape Fear, hits the Cape Fear 14 miles from um, downtown Wilmington. I think that's a truly romantic river. I think the uh, top of Bluff Mountain up in Ashe County, which is flat as anywhere in eastern North Carolina, it's strange to go up a 5,000 foot mountain and then you're on a, you feel like you're in Edgecombe County down near Tarboro. Um, I think that's a pretty romantic place. That, that's a Bluff Mountain is a has more biodiversity than anywhere else in the Southern Appalachians, and there's a lot of biodiversity in the in our uh, mountains. But Bluff Mountain up there in Ash County, just outside of West Jefferson, is is um, kind of the chart topper. And I I think the uh, uh, Joyce Kilmer, old growth uh, poplar forest up there in Graham County. Uh, I think there's a lot of romance to that, and and not just because it's named after a poet, but it's just a it's an amazing exemplar of what our mountain forest used to be. I mean, it is old, old growth, and many have uh, have written of it. Boy, do we have a amazing state. Um, <laughs> We have a couple of questions I'll put together for you to answer from Linda and Barbara. When, uh, one is, where's the best place to purchase Land of Water, Land of Sky? And could you give a quick summary of the book? Uh, in reverse order, this is, a, this is a personal portrait of the state. As I mentioned to Ben, I, I got the map and I looked for where, where I had stories or new stories that I wanted to, to tell. And uh, there's a particular emphasis, I, th I think, on our public trust lands from uh, the east through, oh, uh, in, this, in this part of the state, where I'm just outside of Chapel Hill, uh, 45 minutes to the southwest of where I sit is the 50,000 acre Uwari National Forest. And uh, that's not, a, the, the Uwari Mountains are very old, they're not very they're not real tall, although they seem tall when you're in them. Uh, the peaks are just under a thousand feet. But it's that's it's a big wilderness. The zoo is on the 
northeast side of the Uwaris. Uh, it's gorgeous. It's near a, a number of population centers, and it belongs to us. It belongs to Ben and me and Mary and Kim and everybody else involved in this program and anybody who's listening. And but we tried to focus on these uh, public lands uh, because they are they're so important to our um, uh, natural diversity, uh, maintenance of uh, species, flora and fauna, and um, they're also free or extremely inexpensive to go uh, visit or camp in. So I mean, this is we have we're very very fortunate to have. Um, I mean, we have 300 miles of barrier islands. Half of them belong to the people. I mean, in public trust holding. So. Um, this book is a is a lot of stories, uh, many of them focused on our uh, public lands and the, the variety thereof. Where's the best place to get it? I, um, I hope a bookstore in Wilmington or somewhere thereabouts. Ben, can you help me there? I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, that um, Barnes and Noble have it. Old books on front on Front Street. I'm not sure about books a, mil, uh, books a Million or Pomegranate. Uh, it is, of course, available from the University of North Carolina Press website. Yes. So, anyway, it can be had. It, it certainly can. Well, um, and someone does say that Pomegranate does have it. So, oh, that's good. A great I local bookstore. Uh, TJ says, as a Brunswick County resident since 1979, I'd love to hear any information you have about this area, especially things that are unusual or not common knowledge. About Brunswick County? Yes. Well, I think um, the, the beaches, uh, it was hard for me when I first uh, got into, literally, uh, Brunswick County back in the early 70s, it was a little hard for me to get used to where the sun was, what the sun did, because the, the beaches are south facing uh, rather than east facing, which is the, the outer banks are pretty much looking east. So the sun came up over the, you know, out yonder, straight out over the ocean. And in Brunswick County, the, the sun comes up on the on the left and goes down on the uh, on the right. Um, to, to the west, uh, so that was that's unusual to me. Um, and uh, I remember I read uh, a feature of Ben's uh, some time ago about the name of uh, Lockwood Folly River, and which is a, a fun, kind of interesting uh, piece of lore uh, that Mr. Lockwood uh, built his seagoing ship. Uh, he just built it. Uh, maybe too well and too deep drafted and he could get down the river, but he couldn't get it over the bar uh, there at the, at the mouth of the river, Lockwood Folly River into the sea. And so his ship turned out to be a folly. And um, there's the name of the, of the river. Did I get that? I got somewhere near it. Didn't I Ben? Somewhere near to that. I mean, uh, well, uh, We'll never really, we'll never really know. It, uh, apparently, it was one of the earliest places set, uh, settled in this area when the uh, uh, Cape Fear Indians were still wander, uh, wan uh, wandering the area and were the largest uh, chunk of the population. Uh, did you ever get over into the Green Swamp? Yes, um, and that's a that's another like Bluff Mountain um, up in the west. That's another wonderful nature conservancy project that 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 holding. And um, let's say one more thing about uh, Brunswick County. Uh, my, my wife, Ann, worked with the um, North Carolina Coastal Land Trust, which Camilla Herlewick founded in Wilmington, and, it's, and it is in Wilmington. Walker Golder, formerly of Audubon, is now the, the executive director. Um, Ann worked with Camilla and, and some others from Coastal Land Trust, and the uh, with, with also the Burr Island uh, Conservancy down at the lower end of the, the beaches there in Brunswick. This is back in the uh, 1990s. And eventually, Bird Island, which is about a mile and a half long, instead of being uh, 
developed commercially and residentially, uh, it's it's been preserved and is a, a, a state natural area um, for its uh, water bird nesting nesting values. <coughs> Excuse me, and um, just general delight of uh, open beach down there below Ocean Island Sunset Beach and. Uh, when I first knew that place, it, um, the inlet, which was on that end of Sunset Beach, was called Mad Inlet. And I suppose Mad Inlet still exists on maps, but that inlet, which was uh, deep, you could only cross it uh, safely at low tide, and it would be up to most people's necks, uh, that inlet shoaled up. And now is just straight up beach. You can, walk, you can walk right across it. And if you didn't know that had been a, an inlet, named Matt Inlet, uh, you might just uh, go along unaware there. But uh, it's a, that's an interesting fact, and it's also a, a very um, telling fact of the matter where our inlets are concerned. They, they open up, they close up, they move laterally, and um, what they do the, the, the dynamics of coastal inlets is, and, and appreciating those dynamics is very important to our understanding of what our coast is doing at any given time. And certainly uh, when you look at a, uh, quite a dynamic spot like Hatteras Island, which is about 60 miles long, there are half a dozen places on Hatteras that want to open up and become inlets. And... Um, in the old days, in 1846, in the same storm, uh, Oregon Inlet at the north end and Hatteras Inlet at the south end opened up in the September storm of 1846. Um, all of a sudden, Hatteras Island was an island. And we, we have to appreciate and keep appreciate, appreciating the fact that our coast is dynamic and it changes, the, the, the constant is change. And this is uh, ever important and perhaps increasingly important as we look at um, sea level rise and um, the storm events and what they do, not just to the, the barrier islands, although that's what I'm talking about, but to uh, our, our interior coastlines. And uh, we're, we're blessed with all this water and we're also uh, admonished to uh, pay very close attention to it. And I know this is not uh, news to anyone in the New Hanover or Brunswick uh, territory. And more questions. Uh, this one comes from Jackie. You're a bit of a Renaissance man, school teacher or school storyteller, teacher, musician, conservationist. How do you see all these talents coming together and what is next? Thank you for that compliment. Uh, I think Renaissance man is a, uh, kind and fancy way of describing jack of all trades, uh, which is kind of what uh, uh, I feel like, um, but more with uh, with luck and, and good feeling than uh, I don't feel like I've um, missed out on anything. I've just been, I've been fortunate to um, make music with some very, very talented people for 50 odd years. And I've been fortunate to be able to teach, which is a wonderful way to to live, and uh, and see ideas go forward into the future, and and learn from those who are who are the future. And um, um, I'm, I married a devout conservationist in uh, Ann Carey Kendall, and we both love being a field. And so, um, all, all those things, uh, seem coherent to, to me and, uh, what's next, uh, I, um, I wrote twice as much for North Carolina land of water, land of sky, uh, as I needed, or as UNC press would publish in one book. So I have another book that's, uh, very similar in terms of, uh, place place based and tales and uh, uh, some yarns some some very serious dramatic pieces and uh, I, th I think I will 
go to work on that. And um, since the first one took six years and it also left me with enough material for a second one, I, I think I can do the second one in a, a year or two. And, um, and I think it'll be a good mate to the, to the first. And beyond that, I want to, um, I want to write about uh, agriculture in North Carolina. Um, we have we have long, generally long growing seasons all across the state until you get into the very high hills. And uh, agriculture is, is obviously changing. It's it's changing a lot because of the um, because tobacco the heyday of tobacco is is uh, not really anymore and there are a lot of adjustments that are being made small farming maybe in, in, in a rather different form than um, the time of sharecropping and tenant farming uh, small farming is, is 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 possible there are a lot of um, market gardens and truck farms and um, and markets for them farmers markets and um, ways to get um, specialty crops into into grocery stores and and that sort of thing, and I think it's all uh, very, very interesting. There was a Frank Porter Graham uh, Center for Sustainable Agriculture down in uh, near Wadesboro, Anson County, back in the late '70s, early '80s. It didn't last a, a long time, but its purpose was to help uh, small tobacco farmers get weaned from uh, from that crop as it inevitably would uh, would go out and so I, th I think there are a lot of stories in uh, in that arena I'd like to uh, work on and 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 also emphasize uh, how how valuable our farmlands are we lost several hundred thousand acres in the uh, the decade uh, of 2000 to 2010 I can't remember the exact number but it was a lot and all you need to do is see that number and think and no, we can't lose uh, a quarter million or a million acres of farmland every decade and and have a $91 billion industry. Agriculture is our biggest industry in North Carolina. Uh, $91 billion is the last number I heard Steve Troxler, our Ag Secretary, say. Uh, tourism is, is enormous. It's about $25 billion. So it's it's not much more than a quarter of what agriculture uh, is for us. Uh, the military uh, bases and budgets in mainly in Eastern North Carolina uh, are said to be about $25 billion too, but agriculture is way, way out in front. So I, I, I know there are a lot of stories there I'd like to, to tell. And, um, and I'd like to write some more about boats because <laughs> I love them. And, uh, so that's, those are the things I'm thinking about um, for the next few years. Sounds like you have an awful lot on your plate. Um, I'm trying to see, we've got a, a, still several questions, if you don't mind my asking a few of these. Uh, no. From Kim, she said that you mentioned king mackerel. What is that? Well, it's a play, it's a musical play called King Mackerel and the Blues Are Running uh, about... Oh, back in the mid eighties, uh, a lawyer friend down in Sanford who was very good friends with the Embers uh, beach music band. Uh, he, that's, he called me up and said, do you think you and Jim Wan, my longtime collaborator, you and Jim would like to write a musical for the Embers? And I said, uh, do the Embers need a musical? Uh, they seem to be doing pretty well and have been since about 1958. Uh, but we got into a conversation with them and started writing songs. You know, what kind of musical would it be uh, if the Embers had one? And well, uh, it'd be a beach musical. So we started writing songs about uh, things that a lot of folks, coastal folks have in common, uh, pier fishing, getting your car stuck in the sand, uh, coastal ghost stories like the Mako light uh, out there Mako Station about, uh, what is it, about 15 miles west of Wilmington? Out. 15 or 16. So eventually the embers said, uh, we, don't, we don't think we can afford to get off the road. They were on the road six, 
six days a week, uh, almost year round. There was a time when they played everybody's senior prom. <laughs> I remember them playing in um, on a Saturday afternoon, I think after a football game in Parker Dorm at Chapel Hill. They played everywhere, and they and they still do. They're great. Uh, it's a great band, but they determined that uh, musical theater and its rigors and particulars was not for them. And and so Jim and I said, well, let's just uh, we'll be we'll be the band. We'll be in a in a coastal hotel lounge telling stories and singing songs, and that'll be our theatrical conceit. And we asked Don Dixon, the uh, great songwriter, singer, producer from Lancaster, South Carolina. We asked Don to join us. And so King Mackerel is a, King Mackerel and the Blues are running is a, a musical play about the Southern coast. And it's uh, Jim and Don and I dress up uh, like the fishing buddies we, we are, although I don't think Don has ever baited a hook. Uh, and we have an even, evening of uh, celebration of, of coastal life, uh, Carolina coastal life, Southeastern coastal life. So that's what, in addition to the fish that gave us the name, uh, that's what King Mackerel is. And speaking of which, you got uh, you got back to Don Dixon when you were doing your Charlotte section of Land of Water, Land of Sky. He, um, um, in addition to being a songwriter, he turned his uh, uh, music uh, his music studio in the in the Queen City into a major uh, major musical landmark. Yes, Don has produced scores of albums down there um his own when he had the band arrogance back in the 70s and to the mid 80s uh one of the great cult bands yeah um the smithereens uh the the just just uh, google don dixon musician and, rem hootie and the blowfish uh, don with mitch easter his longtime collaborator by his side produced the first two rem records uh down there in uh in Charlotte. So yeah, I wanted to, um, as we spoke of, I wanted to celebrate that aspect of Charlotte. Um, the musical, the, the decades and decades of, of musical, original musical uh, history that's been made there. And Don is a big part of that. What's some other, uh, uh, if you had to pick, what are some other musical uh, uh, landmarks of, uh, of the Tar Heel State? that people ought to be aware of? Well, uh, there are a lot. And uh, I'd, first of all, I'd say uh, get get David Menconi's relatively recent book, uh, Step It Up and Go, because he gives a, a very uh, keen musical history of the state. And um, I'll be very quick here because there's there's so much to, to say, but uh, we've got, uh, Earl Scruggs inventing the uh, the Scruggs, the three finger bluegrass roll, which he brought to the attention of the world through his um, initially through his work with Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys, and uh, had one of the amazing musical careers of anyone in our state. Uh, Doc Watson, of, of course, from Deep Gap, uh, the finger picking uh, genius, and and uh, really powerful singer. I mean, one of my favorite memories of uh, touring all over North America and beyond with the Red Clay Ramblers was one time we were at a, a restored opera house in Woodstock, Illinois, not, not too far outside Chicago. And we were doing a double bill with Doc. Doc was uh, uh, solo that night. He, he uh, frequently had an accompanist, uh, but this time it was it was just Doc on stage, and then we did a, a set following him. But he warmed up up in his dressing room. Uh, we were all down in the green room putting sandwiches together. This is about an hour before the show. Uh, Doc was up in his, his dressing room warming up, and you could hear it all over the backstage area, uh, that beautiful tenor uh, voice of his, which could drift toward baritone sometimes, but he was singing hymns. I mean, at the top of his lungs, he was warming up his voice. He was singing uh, Rock of Ages and Steal Away, a spiritual. And um, I, so we we're eating sandwiches. I thought, this is, we're being too mundane here. We're, we're just, uh, us ramblers, we're sitting here eating sandwiches. But Doc is just 
you know, filling up the, the world with, with song. Uh, great, great, great singer. Um, and, you know, uh, Emmy Lou Harris started out at a coffee house in Greensboro. Rhiannon Giddens is from up that way. Uh, Maceo Parker, a great uh, sax player from uh, down east. Uh, Thelonious Monk from Rocky Mount. Although he did get out of Rocky Mount as quick as he could. <laughs> he, he did. He, he certainly did. I, I hope, I hope there will be a museum uh, to him over there uh, one day. Um, John Coltrane, born in Hamlet, uh, grew up in High Point. Beautiful statue to him right downtown in, in um, High Point. Uh, Nina Simone from Tryon. Tryon, North Carolina. Yes. Um, it the, the list does go uh, on and on, and um, Chapel Hill, of course, has produced any number of musicians. Uh, Kay Kaiser in the College of Musical Knowledge, most popular radio show in uh, the country for many years, way back. Uh, Andy Griffith went to school here. You know, worked at was uh, Sir Walter Raleigh out at the out at the um, Lost Colony at uh, one point before he was a uh, Sheriff Andy <laughs> of Mayberry. Uh, James Taylor uh, was. Uh, my age uh, came out of Chapel Hill, and uh, his talented uh, sister and and brothers as well. Um, it uh, it's a long list, and and Minconi really does a great job uh, pulling a huge subject together. Step it up and go. Step it up and With go. The yep. And he also gets into things like the African American contribution to country western music, among other things. So anyway. But we're getting off track here. Mary, do we have uh, do, do, do we have any more questions for Blant? You know, a couple more. I think we can get in here tonight. Uh, here's a quick one from Linda. I had heard of the Red Clay Ramblers and today just learned of the Coastal Cohorts. When will one of these groups be back in Wilmington for a concert? Hmm. Uh, thank you very much for asking. We've um, The Ramblers have played at uh, Thalian Hall at... Uh, Oh, the Water Street Cafe when Harper Peterson had that that going. Uh, so the small stage and the big stage, uh, both a lot of fun. Uh, the King Mackerel Show we did, we've done at Thalian Hall, and also we did at the coast, uh, the Coastline Center uh, when we revived it in uh, 1994. Uh, so we have a a good, a, a lot of uh, performance history in Wilmington. I'm glad to say. When we we will be back, uh, I don't know. Everybody's waiting to see who's going to schedule what, when, and where. And um, I I think uh, performing outdoors is uh, makes performers comfortable. Although, and I say that uh, knowing, not just believing, but knowing that Thalian Hall is one of the most beautiful theaters in the world, and it's certainly one of my very, very favorite, and um, I loved. I loved when the stage manager asked us after we uh, did a sound check. Oh, ten or fifteen years ago, she she said, "Have you all ever seen the Thunder Roll?" I'd heard of it. I said, "No." The Thunder Roll was this uh, interesting slanted construct by which cannonballs roll down and make a lot of noise in the ceiling in the upper. Uh, ceiling of Thalian Hall above the plaster ceiling in the room and uh, mimic thunder. Uh, kind of it was a Victorian era sound effect. Yes. And um, we were very grateful that she took us up there to, to, to see the, the, the mechanism. And, um, and she let go, she and a assistant stage, ma stage manager let go of some uh, cannonballs and, and made the noise. That was a lot of fun, but absolutely gorgeous gorgeous theater and um uh, we'll come back as soon as we can as soon as we're invited and um um i'd love to play airly gardens sometime i know that's a, a very popular venue so uh standing by that would be great <laughs> you mentioned harper a moment ago and i noticed on uh our facebook page that he did have a comment saying, hey, Bland, thanks for all the great stories and songs over the years. Keep tracking and reporting on the wild blue yonder and best to Anne, just so you know. Um, also, you. 
I think we have one question, one more we can fit in, and this came from an anonymous attendee, and it is curious regarding social topography of the state. What places and communities have most surprised you and or defined your expectations in terms of personhood, creativity, and culture? I am very partial, um, well, I'm partial to my own hometown of, of Chapel Hill and its role in the uh, integration movement of, of the 1960s, both in terms of public schools. Uh, I was in the seventh grade when Chapel Hill schools f first integrated. Uh, Stanley Vickers, African-American, young man my age. Uh, he was the one whose parents brought suit and integrated the schools. Um, there were a lot of folks in, in favor of it. Back then, of course, there were a lot of folks who weren't. And uh, uh, people my age, we were 11 right then, uh, heard that, you know, if Stanley Vickers comes to this school, the sky will fall. And Stanley did come and the sky didn't fall. And, uh, and we were off and into a, into a new age. So, but to, to witness a lot of the uh, the marches and the um, gatherings, the the singings that that went along with all that. Well, that was that was quite something to be coming of, of age during that time. Uh, in the uh, in that moment, and and also in the current moment, I think uh, we have many communities around the state where immigrants from all over the world have come and settled. I'm thinking about the the Hmong out west and also in Raleigh. Um, I teach students at Chapel Hill who are uh, Asian American, uh, subcontinental Indian American, uh, Nigerian American, uh, Latin American. Uh, we have uh, populations in our state who come to not just Chapel Hill, but to into the state uh, university system from they may have grown up all or most all here, but their parents or grandparents are from somewhere else in the world. And uh, we are an immigrant state. And uh, that's a big thing. And it's a, I think it's a very, very good thing. And it's an energetic matter. Uh, Greensboro is very big in my heart um, for this very reason. Uh, the gate city. Uh, you can extrapolate what that that old motto uh, for the town uh, means or meant. But nowadays, in the Greensboro Guilford Public Schools, there are children whose family who sp speak and whose families speak uh, languages and some dialects thereof, uh, representing uh, uh, over 120 ethnicities in the world. That's, that's a different, that's a new North Carolina and a very uh, expressive one and uh, impressive one. And my wife came back from, uh, uh, she had been to a, a food company um, looking in, uh, studying about seafood up in Greensboro. She came back, she said, try and guess who is doing the big, the filleting of the big fish. Uh, at that company in Greensboro, I said, I don't know. She said, Montaigne Yards. I said, Montaigne Yards, such as from Southeast Asia? She said, yep, they're the ones, you know, running the big knives down the, the fish. And she said, they're doing a very good job of it too, because uh, you could just about read a newspaper through the slender membrane that's left on those skeletons. So I, I think... Um, you know, we, we've long had um, Caucasian, African-American, and Native American populations here, and we, and we still do, of course. And we are adding, uh, in terms of uh, population diversity, we're adding people and culture from, from all over the world. And um, I think that's a pretty big deal. Um, because uh, there are 50 states, there's a lot of room 
uh, around the U.S. of A. But these, we're talking about people who are choosing, who want to come here and join, join us and let us join them. And um, so I, I, I think that's a, the, those social forces which will um, have helped increase our population from uh, 10 to 11 million in the past decade or to, to, to 10 and a half million, we'll, we'll be aiming towards 12 million by 2030. And that's a lot of responsibility. And it's also a lot of opportunity, economic opportunity. And um, so, but we, we need to be um, thinking that way, if we're not already, that we are an immigrant state uh, now more than ever. And meanwhile, we, we have efforts to preserve the old hoi toyed uh, dialect of the Outer Banks and uh, the, Gullah Geechee, the Gullah Geechee Corridor here down here in southeastern North Carolina, preserving uh, early Af African American culture, some of which uh, was uh, preser preserved from the homeland. There's a lot going on. Yes, yes, there is, and, and, um, and we can be proud of it. Okay. Marius seems to be sort of hinting that it's about time for us to wind this up. So, Bland, we want to thank you. I mean, we could talk. We could talk another two hours, I think. But you do need to get back down uh, down here. Bring your and bring your piano and your and your uh, and your uh, banjo friends with you. <laughs> and um, anyway, uh, we will wind up and go on uh, uh, on hiatus at this point. But we want to thank uh, thank. Mary and WHQR for giving us a little platform here to talk, and uh, please uh, uh, please uh, keep uh, checking Tar Heel lit uh, Tar Heel lit uh, literature, uh, uh, pomegranate books, and old books on Front Street are two good places to start. So, Mary, thank you very much for a nice evening. Thank you, Mary. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Blam. Thank you, Ben, and thanks to everyone who who joined us tonight. Yeah. And much. Ben, take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.